This uh, uh, presentation is entitled Justice at Five Points, and for those who are not familiar with the Martin Scorsese movie, uh, it takes place in the 1850s and 60s in a neighborhood that was known as the Five Points located in Lower Manhattan. This is what it uh, looked like in, in an engraving, uh, a contemporaneous engraving. And uh, the federal courthouse area is, is built upon it today. This is some of the excavation work that uh, took place uh, during the 1990s uh, to build a new courthouse. And you see this uh, large tower on the uh, right-hand side is the um, the old courthouse still used for the Second Circuit uh, Court of Appeals. Uh, so we uh, call this justice at five points and 100 years ago a flower, a flour mill company in upstate New York decided to get in on a new and growing trend which is, was to use human figures photographs of human figures in their commercial advertising and uh, this young lady was um, was named Abigail, uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, she was under the age of uh, legal consent, and she was too young to enter into a contract. And the uh, the uh, Franklin Mills Company uh, had had not asked her parents for permission, so they they sued for the for her uh, uh, appearing in this advertisement under a relatively new theory of law, the right of privacy. Uh, but this had been argued in a famous law review article in the Harvard Law Review by Brandeis and Warren in or about 1890. And the New York courts decided, ultimately, the New York Court of Appeals decided that New York State did not recognize a right of privacy as a matter of common law, although the legislature was always free to, to grant such a right. Um, believe it or not, um, after uh, the family lost this case, there was such a thing in those days as public outrage. You don't see it today, but there was public outrage, and as a result, a statute was enacted called the New York Civil Rights Law, um, sections 50 and 51, which made it not only a, mister, a misdemeanor, but civilly actionable uh, for the use of someone's photograph or name in a commercial advertisement without uh, written consent. And uh, this statute has been used over the past 100 years. This is not only the 40th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination, it's the 100th anniversary of the New York Civil Rights Law. This statute has been used by such personalities as Johnny Carson, Cary Grant, Christy Brinkley, Woody Allen, Howard Hughes, and, and many other celebrities uh, to prevent their images from being associated with products that they don't necessarily want to be associated with. And that's the way the state of the law was for about 80 years until 1993 when Random House published the book Case Closed by Gerald Posner. And this print advertising campaign had actually been preceded a couple of weeks earlier uh, by a teaser uh, promising to name the guilty parties in the assassination of President Kennedy. And then uh, a week later, this uh, ad ran in the local and national editions of the New York Times, uh, naming six of the uh, critics of the Warren Commission as being guilty of misleading the American public and making the representation uh, that there was only one man, one gun, one inescapable conclusion about the assassination, urging uh, uh, readers to buy and read the book Case Closed. Robert Groton uh, and, uh, was one of the uh, persons depicted, and he was, uh, they attributed a quote to him, I'll read it because you probably can't uh, read it from the screen. Who killed President Kennedy? It took a combination of the CIA, controlled Cuban exiles, organized crime, and the ultra-right wing with the support of some politically well-connected wealthy men to pull it off. Well. Be that as it may, the problem was that Bob never said this, he never wrote it, and he had always uh, taken the position uh, that we need to find out who killed President Kennedy, and he had focused his work mainly on the photographic and film evidence. In fact, uh, the History Channel seems to be rerunning the men who killed Kennedy this, this week ad infinitum. You can see the interview that Bob did with them in which he said, uh, um, just 
less than a year before this advertisement, uh, or, or less than a couple of years before this advertisement appeared, he said, we need to find out. He doesn't know. So this had really been written by Harrison Livingstone, uh, but there was no indication in the advertisement uh, of that fact. And the problem was that Bob was coming out with his own book, competing with Posner's Case Closed. And so this gave a very erroneous impression of, of uh, the nature of Bob's work and, and what he had to offer. The genesis of, of this uh, uh, at Random House uh, is reflected in uh, the following quote from Robert Loomis, who was uh, uh, Gerald Posner's editor. All the conspiracy theories have undermined the public's belief in government, and that, to me, is a crime. This attitude is still prevalent in many quarters, and I believe it, it has a great deal to do with why we are still here discussing the case 40 years later. Uh, Posner himself had said that he thought the conspiracy theorists have made us lose faith in government. And here's another key uh, point about the entire controversy. I, I think that the debate over evidence in, in many respects is a false debate. And uh, what we are really talking about, what we are really contending about most of the time, is our value systems and, and uh, whether uh, we want to uphold uh, blind faith in government or whether we want to uphold the right of the public to question. Uh, so. Uh, we saw some things that were wrong about, uh, about this ad, not only in terms of the New York civil rights law and the use of the photograph without uh, Bob's permission, but also the misattribution of a conspiracy theory that uh, Mr. Groden did not sponsor, did not represent. And so we brought suit under not only the New York civil rights law, but also the federal Lanham Act uh, for making false and misleading representations concerning the nature of Bob's products and services. Not only did he have the book um, um, the Killing of a President, is that, that was the title. He also had a companion video, The Case for Conspiracy, which he recently put out on DVD. And, uh, and I commend that to your attention. These are, these are among the best photographic and film compilations that you'll ever see about this case. Uh, and so uh, the Lanham Act had recently been amended in 1989, not only to include false representations about one's own product, but also to make it actionable if you made false representations about someone else's product. And, and these were uh, the theories that we relied upon. The uh, Second Circuit, uh, uh, in, which is the Federal Appellate Court in New York, had uh, uh, decided, and, and this is still good law as far as I know, uh, that uh, there is no measurement of what the impact on the public is concerned when a, a, an advertisement is explicitly false. You don't have to take surveys as to how it was understood. It's enough to prove falsity. Uh, this same theory had been used um, um, in a case um, in the same court uh, in which uh, Cuisine Arts uh, and Robo Coupe were fighting over trademarks and, and, and uh, competing advertising uh, representations. And uh, uh, the uh, United States District Court for the Southern District of New York had found this form of advertisement accusing uh, the other party of misleading the public uh, to be uh, uh, violative of uh, unfair competition laws. This, this case occurred uh, before the Lanham Act amendments, but uh, undoubtedly the holding would still apply. Um, uh, another court, the First Circuit, had found uh, an allegation of blatantly misleading the public sufficiently factual to be proved true or false. So we thought that we were on reasonable grounds. And as far as the First Amendment considerations were concerned, uh, the Second Circuit Court had held previously that movies, plays, and books are, after all, products sold in the marketplace. Uh, and uh, so some, some government regulation was warranted. Uh, here in Pennsylvania, there's a famous precedent in the Third Circuit uh, about reference to a public issue in commercial advertising, including negative comparative advertising, uh, does not immunize false and misleading information from government regulation under the Lanham Act. That, that's the U.S. Health Care versus Blue Cross of Greater Philadelphia. The defendants argued that the advertisement accurately represented uh, Mr. Posner's book uh, and therefore could not be false and, and were uh, also protected under the First Amendment. This did not uh, answer the question, what about the attacks, the negative attack against Grodin and the other uh, 
uh, assassination uh, authors and researchers who were depicted in the ad. Uh, besides which, uh, going back to a Supreme Court case from the 1920s called 95 Barrels of Oil, uh, the, the courts have construed ads in such a way that even if an advertisement makes, makes a truthful statement about the advertiser's product, if it attacks, if it falsely attacks another person's product, it is false for, for purposes of unfair competition law. Whoops. So, uh, we, the defendants brought their customary motion to dismiss, and after all the papers had gone in and all the oral arguments had been had, they brought up a, a, a new late argument that the Kennedy assassination is so controversial and seemingly irresolvable that since no one has ascertained with any certainty what happened, the ad must be taken as opinion. And uh, that, that should sound familiar. We, we've been hearing that the past week as well. Uh, they also said finding a statement of fact in the advertisement would require this court to determine the truth or falsity of the conclusion of the Warren Commission. Well, you have to be familiar with the law of summary judgment and in particular with a trilogy of cases that the Supreme Court decided in 1986 to understand what was going on here with these arguments. Uh, they were raising at the 11th hour the argument that Mr. Groton could not prove the advertising campaign false because he could not, he, he could not prove that the Warren Commission report was false. And that under the precedence of the Supreme Court dating back to 1986 is enough to trigger a burden upon the plaintiff in this case to come forward and say yes I can prove the advertisement the advertisement false so we responded by letter to the judge saying we offer to prove through what the government has represented to be the original autopsy x-rays of President Kennedy uh, that uh, he was assassinated by more than one gunman so that a jury may decide who is guilty of misleading whom. Uh, the defendants were relying upon uh, analogy to libel law, and this is a form of commercial defamation that we were arguing over. Um, the, the essential point is the statement is not protected if it states or implies assertions of fact which are provable as false. The standard is verifiability. And, and so it's, it's, uh, is it capable of being objectively characterized as true or false? That's the test. The judge in the case, John S. Martin, Jr., uh, did not respond to our offer uh, to submit uh, a response to the defendant's argument and instead issued a decision stating that the plaintiff has failed to establish any factual dispute and we failed to establish any genuine issue. He also stated that the proliferation of theories about the assassination is proof that there is no universally accepted factual answer to the question who killed President Kennedy and, and therefore uh, the ad must be interpreted as opinion. Of course, I could go through a whole treatise on the informal fallacies of, uh, of logic and reasoning and how they apply to this kind of uh, argumentation. Uh, suffice it to say for our purposes today that the issue is not unanimity. The issue is, you know, what is fair and just and what is the truth of the matter. Um, and, and here again, uh, the judge stated that they rejected the plaintiff's assertion uh, that uh, the ad is capable of objective verification. While this may be true hypothetically, the known evidence concerning the Kennedy assassination and the extensive debate over the Warren Commission's findings demonstrate that the actual facts will never be verifiable to everybody's satisfaction. Bear in mind, he had no evidence in front of him uh, at the time that he wrote this. He also made uh, several references to conspiracy theorists um, and uh, referring to the people depicted in the ad, they are all conspiracy theorists of one sort or another. Uh, even William Sapphire, the, uh, the language expert of the New York Times, had remarked on the prejudicial character of this kind of epithet. Uh, what you do when you call any expressed suspicion, especially a complicated one, a conspiracy theory, you dismiss it as nonsense, the product of an unduly suspicious or even paranoid mind. Well, we did bring a, uh, a motion uh, to reopen, to reconsider, vacate the judgment. 
Uh, and this time we had, fortunately, uh, with the assistance of Dr. Randy Robertson, who you met yesterday, and Dr. Weck, and Bob Groden, um, we uh, addressed the issue of the head wounds and whether President Kennedy had been shot once or twice in the head. I'm going to go over some of that evidence with you now. Uh, just to review for, for, for those who are here for the first time today and who have not been following the controversy, the problem is that the autopsy pathologists found an entrance wound in the rear of President Kennedy's head, approximately 2.5 centimeters laterally to the right and slightly above the external occipital protuberance, which is a bony prominence in the back of the head, uh, just above the fold of the neck. Um, and this, this was uh, outlined in their uh, autopsy report. Um, and they specified that in the underlying bone, they found a corresponding wound through the skull, which exhibits beveling of the margins of the bone when viewed from the inner aspect of the skull. Now, if you were here yesterday, remember the discussion between Dr. Bodden and Dr. Robertson, which Dr. Bodden insisted that there was you know, there may be a fracture at that site, but there's no hole. We're going to examine that a little bit more, more closely right now. And this is a diagram that was uh, made by a uh, fellow by the name of Rydberg, a military artist under Humes's supervision. Notice, if you will, the, the solid uh, mass of bone between what is purported to be the entrance wound and the larger exit defect here. Roy Kellerman, the Secret Service agent who was driving, uh, who was in a, the passenger side of the front seat of the limousine at the time of the assassination and who attended the autopsy that night, uh, testified before uh, our inspector that uh, there was a space of about two inches here of, of bone between the uh, entrance wound and the exit defect. And this diagram has it about right. Also, during the uh, House Committee proceedings, all three of the uh, autopsy pathologists uh, marked a skull uh, at the uh, location where they said the entrance defect was, and of course, uh, it agreed with their autopsy report. It disagreed with the Clark panel and with the uh, f a majority of the forensic pathology panel for the uh, HSCA. Uh, here's a drawing that was uh, done for the staff of the HSCA by uh, Richard Lipsy. Uh, who was present at the autopsy, uh, and this shows, as you can see, um, maybe I can point that out to you, and maybe not. I, I understand that this dot shows up very light in the back, but you can see that Mr. Lipsy has made a mark on the rear of the skull which conforms to the location uh, for the entrance wound in the head that was given by the autopsy pathologist. However, in 1968, uh, Ramsey Clark appointed a panel uh, uh, of very prominent uh, physicians to examine the autopsy x-rays and photographs in the archives. Actually, uh, I, I believe that, they, yes, they were appointed in 68. The report was not issued until January of 69. Uh, they found that the autopsy pathologists had been mistaken and that there was, uh, the entrance hole was actually 100 millimeters, uh, 10 centimeters, 4 inches above the wound uh, alleged in the uh, EOP. Uh, so what we had was either a migrating wound or, or a second wound. Either the autopsy uh, pathologists were mistaken or, or both sets of doctors were correct. Uh, this is uh, the, this diagram, which was done by Ida Docks for the HSCA, shows uh, the uh, basically the Clark panel version of the uh, of the head wound, uh, with which the majority of the FPP uh, agreed. And you will notice uh, that this diagram uh, does not portray the transverse fracture uh, that Dr. Robertson pointed out to you yesterday uh, at the site where Drs. Humes, Boswell, and Fink placed the entrance wound uh, in. By the way, just as an aside, this is a controversial photograph which has been called Fox Number 8 by the researchers. And you see uh, this semicircular defect which the uh, majority of the uh, HSCA's forensic pathology panel decided was uh, the uh, exit point for the uh, 
bullet that entered the rear of the skull. Uh, if it's, I, I must say it's, it's obvious to me, I don't know about you, and I fail to see how anyone could, could have failed to notice it at the bench, uh, although there was never any mention made of it by uh, any of the uh, autopsy pathologists. Dr. Robertson mentioned uh, Papa's rule yesterday, and uh, I thought we we'd ju would just uh, go into it. Uh, first, let me let me just go back for for a moment to to uh, to make an additional point. Dr. Bodden says there was no hole uh, where Hume's Boswell and Fink said there was. How do we know? How can we be confident uh, that there was? First of all, there was internal beveling. This was noted by all three pathologists, but recall that Dr. Fink arrived late in the proceeding, late in the evening, after the brain had been removed. The removal of the brain necessitated the removal of bone uh, at the site of the vertex where uh, the HSCA panel said the entrance wound was, and yet Dr. Fink uh, described in detail his examination of internal beveling at the site of the entrance wound in the, in the skull. He could not have been talking about the higher wound referred to by the Clark panel and the HSCA panel uh, because that, the, the bone and the brain and, uh, in that area had already been removed by the time he arrived. And so the, these three doctors, Humes is now deceased, uh, but all three of them, uh, whenever uh, questioned about this, agreed uh, as to the location of the internal beveling that they examined. Uh, we also had witnesses, as I showed you, uh, Roy Kellerman, Richard Lipsy, um, and uh, the drawing that was done by uh, uh, Rydberg at, at the uh, behest of Humes, which further corroborates the location. Uh, Dr. Botten also has argued that because the cerebellum uh, was intact, the wound could not have been at the lower location identified by Humes, Boswell, and Fink. Uh, we can answer this by resort to an MRI, and I'll come back to these. And this is an MRI what the, uh, that was made by uh, Dr. Robertson, uh, and uh, it shows that the bullet, if, if it behaved as Humes, Boswell, and Fink had it, would have entered two centimeters above the cerebellum, and the, the distance would have increased as the bullet transversed uh, uh, the skull. So uh, the, both of these arguments uh, must fail in, in light of uh, what the evidence actually shows. So going back now to courtesy of the Iraq war, uh, these, these photographs illustrate for us Papa's rule, uh, which is that where the skull has been fractured by one impact and then another, uh, the fractures propagated by the second injury will stop where they intersect with the pre-existing fracture lines caused by the first injury. And this can be illustrated uh, th in this case by uh, bullet holes in, in a windshield, which is a good illustration, by the way, because windshields are usually not single pane glass, and you usually see it, this principle illustrated with single panes. These are laminated, uh, and you will see that uh, the, the, the fracture lines don't necessarily have to terminate abruptly. Uh, because of the laminated structure, there can be a little bit of overlap, and I think we also see that on the, uh, on the Kennedy skull x-rays. This is um, uh, where you see the arrow on the lower left-hand corner of the, uh, of the uh, screen. Uh, that, that is the transverse fracture at the site of the uh, Humes, Boswell, and Fink entry wound as identified by Dr. Robertson, and this fracture has never been mentioned by any, any of the examiners uh, going back to the original inventorying of the materials by Humes, Bo Boswell, and Fink in January of 1967. Um, what you see, uh, if I can point this out, that white circle there uh, is the site of what was identified by the Clark panel and the HSCA as a six, uh, roughly 6.5 millimeter round metallic fragment. This was seen the night of the autopsy on the x-rays by Edward Reed, one of the technicians present in the morgue. 
Uh, and then we have the fractures radiating down from, from that site, which is basically what the Clark and uh, HSCA panels have identified as the site of their wound. We have the uh, fractures radiating down and intersecting with the transverse fracture. And notice something very interesting. This is a, a, a detail from a diagram that was drawn by uh, J. Thornton Boswell, one of the pathologists on the night of the autopsy. It's on the reverse side of his face sheet, and it identifies the, the three, four, six triangular fragment of bone that we see um, um, delineated by the fracture pattern that was identified by Dr. Robertson. This is a ladder, the lateral skull x-ray that was published. There is one that has never been published and remains in the archives. Again, the arrow on the left uh, side of your screen shows the site of the, of the fracture, and Dr. Robertson has said that it is certainly wide enough to accommodate a bullet. Um, interestingly, you have the so-called cloud of, of uh, fragments here, we don't see any fragment, metallic fragmentation at this site, uh, which tells us that the bullet that entered there did not fragment until it exited the skull. Now, here we get into something very interesting I want you to watch very carefully. This is frame 312. This is the moment in the Zapruder film where uh, most people, critics and defenders of the Warren Report alike, seem to agree that the first uh, headshot, uh, that a, a shot did strike President Kennedy's head. We move to frame 313. Um, and we have this uh, terrible explosion uh, on the, uh, uh, the right uh, temporoparietal fronto region of the, uh, of the uh, head. 314, what I want to point out to you here is that the top and the back of President Kennedy's head is still neatly combed and in place. You're going to see this on the filmic uh, uh, rendition of this in, in just a moment. But I, I just want to show you the stills to call your attention to this. And then the, here's 315. Now we see a disturbance on the top and back. Uh, the hair becomes a little bit more disheveled. And that continues at 316. Let me run that by you in very rapid succession. And then we'll take a look at the film. Okay. These are exhibits that were submitted to uh, the, uh, the court in the Groton versus Random House case as part. That's 313. Now we have 314. Notice the top and back of his head is still neatly combed and in place, and it changes at 315. This, by the way, is a slightly more precise rendition of the theory that was popularized by uh, Josiah Tink Thompson in Six Seconds in Dallas, the double headshot. It's 312 to 313. Then we go 313 to 314. Now you see the disturbance clearly on the top and back of, of President Kennedy's head. Dr. George McConnell, one of the radiological consultants to the House Select Committee on Assassinations, uh, noted that there was an elevation of the galea uh, at the site of, of this, uh, the higher uh, wound, and which is where it can be, not necessarily, but it can be characteristic of a wound of entry in gunshot cases. Okay. The problem is this. Here is a, an autopsy photograph uh, that was taken from the head of the table with the president lying in the supine position. We see uh, this uh, terrible damage to the uh, right parietal uh, region. Uh, we do not see that in uh, frames 313 or 314. We don't even get a hint of it until Zapruder frames 315 and 316. So there, there must have been some separate mechanism to cause this damage to President Kennedy's head. And uh, my contention is the man was shot twice in the head, and there just can't be any serious question about it. Uh, Dr. Wett went to the archives with Dr. Robertson and, and agreed that uh, the, the, the fracture, the transverse fracture, seems to be consistent with uh, a, a bullet entry. And, uh, and where the original autopsy uh, pathologist uh, stated it was. It's, this was very difficult. It was difficult for me to ask him to do this, and I'm sure it was difficult for him to do, because he had previously taken the, p the public position uh, that President Kennedy, the, the medical evidence, supported only one shot to the rear of the skull. 
And Dr. Wett's opinion, by the way, is contingent upon the authenticity of this photograph of the, uh, the back of the head. Uh, this is a controversial photograph. If, if it is genuine, then it shows an entry wound at the vertex, and uh, it also shows the location where Humes, Boswell, and Fink identified um, and if this if this if this is uh, authentic, the man was shot twice from behind. Uh, if if there's a problem with this photograph, it's possible. And I'm agnostic on on the directionality. I don't even think the directionality of the second shot is important. Uh, it's enough that there's physical evidence of a of a second shot uh, to the head. Well, needless to say, uh, Judge Martin wasn't uh, very interested in looking at our evidence and. Uh, uh, stated that we had produced nothing new and, and so we were consigned to an appeal to uh, the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, the chief judge of which at the time was Earl Warren's former senior law clerk uh, who reserved this case to himself uh, as, as head of the, uh, of the appellate panel. And uh, his, his, uh, his take on the case was that Mr. Groton had ample opportunity to present evidence outside the pleadings, and, uh, but that uh, we had failed to present facts supporting the claim of false advertising. Uh, and, and, and despite the fact that we had actually objected to expanding this lawsuit to include the assassination controversy, uh, Newman also said that Groton's real interest in filing this suit was an attempt to use the courts as a forum for ascertaining the facts, as, as if, you know, not that there's anything wrong with that, but uh, as if it's uh, some great uh, abuse of the judicial process. I want to also mention something uh, about Mark Lane, who also uh, brought a suit uh, because his photograph was used in the same advertising campaign. He, was, uh, he brought suit down in uh, the District Court for the District of Columbia. I did not represent him. He was represented by a very fine attorney who had once served as a law clerk uh, to Judge Henry Friendly, of the, uh, the late Henry Friendly of the Second Circuit. Uh, and, and here's what uh, Lamberth had to say about, uh, about Mark. Uh, Random House in public publicizing its own book has publicized Lane's as well, so they did him a favor by attacking him in this ad. And uh, the, the, he called it a comparatively bland charge uh, and a, con a constrained chastisement. It's quite simply untenable that someone espousing Lane's views would take umbrage at the rather reserved assessment that he misled the American public. This is, this is the federal courts. Under Lane's lopsided rules of engagement, he gets his choice of weaponry and tactics. Random House must do battle unarmed and march openly in a straight line. Well, I've never seen, I, I, have, I have seen judges attack litigants before, but I, uh, considering Mr. Lane's uh, longtime membership in the bar, his, his standing in the community, I, I have not seen a, a litigant attacked like this in, in a very uh, long while. And he, if Judge La Lamberth's solution was if, if Lane is offended by this kind of advertisement, he may elect to minimize his exposure by opting for a lower public profile. This is the, uh, a photograph of the attorney on, on your left uh, who represented a Random House uh, and the New York Times and Mr. Posner in this litigation. Uh, the woman on the right is Judge Judith Kay, the Chief Judge of the State of New York uh, and the Chief Judge, of course, of the New York Court of Appeals. Judge Kay is presenting my adversary with the John J. McCloy Memorial Award. Uh, so, look, after 40 years, <laughs> what do you expect? Uh, I, I have to say, uh, I have to tell you that uh, as a result of my criticizing uh, Judge Martin for uh, his decision and, and trying to disqualify him, uh, I was disbarred from the practice of law in, in New York. Uh, I, I state this not to appeal to your sympathy, uh, but as a, as a cautionary tale, this is what it means to stand toe-to-toe, -to -toe, even 40 years later, with people who regard criticism of the Warren Report and the continued investigation of this case as a threat to public tranquility, as a threat to respect for public officials and public institutions. Uh, it's dangerous work. And uh, all I can say is mostly uh, to the, especially to the younger people
people in the audience never give in. Dr. King taught us that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Never give in. Bobby Kennedy warned us, justice delayed is democracy denied. Never give in. For it is written in the book of Job, there is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity can hide themselves. And the prophet Isaiah tells us, he giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Never give in until the truth is known, until justice is done. God bless us all. Thank you very much.